let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Puna Wong Yin On. Growing up from a typical Chinese family that believed in a mixture of Taoism and Buddhism, peppered with lots of superstition, Dr. Puna Wong found it difficult to accept the devotional practices of offering and praying. He studied in a Christian missionary school and spent about 10 years of his life studying the Bible diligently. Still, his mind was full of unanswered questions about life. His quest continued until one day he chanced upon a book entitled The Dhammapada by the late Venerable K. Sri Dhammananda in a bookshop. He read the first two twin verses and that changed his life forever. Mine is for most, mine is chief. This is very different from all the religious books that he has ever read, and it touched the deepest parts of his searching mind. He bought the book and read it, and his walk up the Buddha's path started that very day. Dr. Puna Wong graduated from University of Malaya. He joined Monash University, Malaysia in 2007 as an associate professor in internal medicine to form the pioneer faculty of the clinical school in Johor Bahru. He has been sharing the Dhamma regularly in Malaysia, Singapore, and Jakarta in the past two decades and was an invited speaker at the third, seventh, and eighth global conference of Buddhism. And of course, he's a huge Star Wars fan. Dr. Puna authored his first Dhamma book entitled Walking in the Buddha's Footprints in 2016, which consists of a compilation of 100 reflective essays by him. In October this year, he launched his second Dhamma book entitled Breaking Myths and is now sharing chapters from this book with us. Today, he is going to share with us the topic called An Insurance Policy, over to you, sir. Good evening, Nambo Buddhaya, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. I'm particularly happy today because we have got 14 Buddhist organizations that have collaborated for tonight's sharing. And I think this is amazing. One of the things in Malaysia is that we have lots of little Buddhist societies scattered all over the country. And what we need really in this 21st century where communication is instant to unify all these little groups into a big voice. And so I'm very, very happy that tonight we have a new record for our little group. And that is we have got 14 centers that have collaborated and that is fantastic. Thank you, Sadhu. Secondly, I can see that my moderators are getting younger and younger, which is amazing because most of the time all over Southeast Asia, when I'm invited to share, I'm among the youngest in the hall. So to see moderators or chair people all the way from this first series that started about two months ago, getting younger and younger is an amazing thing to me. I think tonight we probably had the youngest moderator till date. And today I'm sharing on breaking myths and insurance policy. I've asked brother Bobby to invite all his colleagues who are in the insurance industry to join us because this is something which I think they might be interested in. Now, many people, and I'm sure you have lots of friends and relatives among them, believe in one or even more powerful divine being or beings. And among these people are many very good people, excellent moral conduct, kind, generous people whom I respect and feel humbled by their good deeds and kind hearts. And there are also many who treat whatever faith or creed or religion that they believe as an insurance policy. 
And what do I mean? Now, of course, this group includes many who call themselves Buddhists. One of the things in which people in both Singapore and Malaysia had been concerned about and raised many times in discussions is that when they look at the statistics, the number of Buddhists in both Malaysia and Singapore is not growing. And in many cases, even seem to be reducing. I assure them that I do not think this is correct because many people label themselves as Buddhists because there's no other box there to think. So if there are none of the other religions, they label themselves as Buddhists. Those of you who are in your 50s and 60s now, or 70s, the Waga Irma's generation, will look back and remember how few Buddhist activities there were when we were Janice age. There was hardly any beyond Mahavihara, beyond Sikya in, hardly any. It was actually difficult for a young person 40 years ago to find Buddhist activities. You got to make it a very active search. Today, we have centers in every town, every city in the country. Yes, of course, many are very active, some are not so active, but it is no longer difficult. And at a click of a button, you can access it. I think that the generation of people who were just buying an insurance policy by calling themselves Buddhist versus people who actually know something about what the Buddha taught had increased in the last three decades. Certainly in my own personal experience, when I go around and I look, I can see that people are now more knowledgeable than 30 years ago. Now, people who buy religion as an insurance policy do some things that they feel they must be done, for example, or maybe attend service, or maybe a full moon, a new moon, go to service, etc. The sub day, oh, go and make some prostrations. And if something goes wrong, yes, I paid my premium. And now I start demanding for divine help, whether imagined or promised by someone or real. And what is their premium for this eternal life in heaven policy? Well, their premium is just attending service. Whether you actually believe it or not is immaterial. Just attend occasionally or maybe regularly or contributing money to support religion. So when problems arise, show your membership card and demand that the laws of physics and nature be changed because you have this insurance policy. Now you might laugh at this analogy that I've put up, but when you look at it in all seriousness, you will realize this is very true. And I'm sure every one of us in this audience tonight will have friends and relatives who are in this category. For them, belief is a leap of faith. Now, what do we mean when we say faith? Faith means there is something you have not seen, something unproven, something you may not even believe in, or something that you may personally find even ridiculous, but you accept it on faith. It's a leap of faith, as the expression goes. This is a gamble that you are taking for this insurance policy that you have subscribed to, and you are betting on the rewards of loyalty to some divinity for a return of some benefit when dead or in trouble. Now, many Buddhists are similarly in this category. They have downgraded the Buddha from a supremely enlightened being to be like a god or a big brother. Now, all of us are used to small amounts that we pay as premium in term or accident or health insurance. Now, this premium is burned. Should you have no claims? And of course, thank goodness you had no claims. So most people accept this and see this as a reasonable investment against possible eternal damnation with the added benefit of heavenly delights, if ever true, 
and an all-powerful big brother to help you. So for many people, they treat their religion like an insurance, just in case hell actually exists. So what do we want to do as Dhamma Dutta workers? We want to change this group of insurance and once a year Buddhists to become knowledgeable Dhamma fairs. And if only one person is helped in this sharing, then our goal is met. And our long hours spent preparing all this is well utilized. For example, Brother Ju Singh, the main driver of this series of talks, he was a few years ago a once a year Buddhist. I only see him on Versailles Day. And that too, he confessed to me. He comes just before the lunch dana. Now, he saw the truths of life directly. And you can see that over the last few years, he's completely changed. He's now a very highly engaged Dhamma fairer and worker, sadhu for his wholesome work. So if I can make another 100 people see the truths of life, then my life would have been well lived. Pascal's wager. This may be familiar to those of you who are interested in philosophy. Pascal's wager is an argument in philosophy presented by a 17th century French philosopher, mathematician, physicist, Blaise Pascal. He posits that humans will bet with their lives that God either exists or does not exist. And should there not be this divine God to solve all your present and future eternal problems, all that the human being had betted on and lost is just a premium. So Pascal's argument is that this gamble is worth it, that it is safer to believe even if there is no evidence that this divine being exists. So for many, it's a gamble. And this is Pascal's wager put into a modern form. So if it does not exist and you have been a good person, well, oh well, you've been a good person. You don't lose anything. But you have been a horrible person, womanizing, etc., etc. And no, he doesn't exist. Well, it was fun while it lasted. Now he exists. And you've been a good person, phew. So you think you get eternal life. He exists. You didn't put your bet correctly. Damnation. So this is Pascal's wager. So as you can see, there is no wisdom, just in case being the policy. And Calvin and Hobbes, two of my favorite philosophers, you learn a lot of Buddhism from these two chaps, you know. Well, Calvin says, well, I've decided to believe in Santa Claus, no matter how preposterous he sounds. Well, many divine beings sound equally preposterous. And so Hobbes say, well, what convinced you? And Calvin said, the simple risk analysis. Calvin say, I want presents, lots of presents. Just like I want heaven, I want forgiveness. I want a guarantee of eternal life. So why risk? not getting them over a matter of belief. Heck, he said, I'll believe anything they want. Just give it to me. How cynically enterprising of you, Hobbes said. And Calvin said, well, it's the spirit of Christmas. But this is a modern 21st century comic form of presenting Pascal's wager. But Homer Simpson, another great philosopher, American, of course, as you all know, with the title of the longest running television series in history, 20 over years. And Homer Simpson in his great wisdom says, but suppose you have chosen the wrong God. And every time you go to church, we are just making him madder and madder and madder. Well, Homer Simpson is not wrong too. So you have this cartoon of these three people of three different fates. We died, but at least we shall finally see which of us is right all along. And ta-da, crap, he says. So this is Homer Simpson's 
version of anti Pascal's wager. So Pascal's wager is wrong because it assumes that there are only two possible outcomes. He exists and he rewards or he does not exist. And of course, Pascal himself admit there's no evidence. Homer Simpson very wisely projected that this may be completely fraudulent because of the many gods objection. And of course, as a result, Pascal's thesis is false. In another modern 21st century term, the modern version of Pascal's wager is sucking up to as many gods as possible just in case one of them is real. Uh, that's the 21st century Jenny's generation language. Now, for anyone who believes in his faith, and you ask him to contribute his entire life's focus, everything that he owns as premium, his entire life's direction and activities to be invested in this, you will find only very few takers, very few people. Well, maybe Didi Huachai, maybe Ju Sing. And the reason is because of the overwhelming majority. Deep inside, they have doubts. As an insurance policy for a small premium, well, that's fine. But if you ask them, say, why don't you can make your whole life's direction for the Sasana? Why don't you work full time for the Sasana? Why don't you be a Dhamma Dutta worker? No pay, one, huh? you have to even take out money. Huh? Why don't you do that? For most people, they will not because it is just faith. It is a leap into the unknown for which they are not willing to bet everything. Small premium, no problem. Very few will be able to do it. And that is why the Buddha kept asking us to ask, test and challenge everything that is taught to us as long as it is just a belief, faith, it is weak and may collapse with the first doubt or challenge. But once you know, then there is nothing to believe or fear. If I tell Sister Janice that you've got two arms and two legs, and Sister Janice has faith in me, so she believes that because Dr. Wong said I've got two arms and two legs, I believe you. Now, if Janice is to look at her own arms and to look at her limbs, her lower limbs, then she say, hey, I have two arms and two legs. Does Janice need to believe in me anymore? Does Janice need to have a view that Dr. Wong is correct? No, Janice now has direct experiential knowledge. She has wisdom that she has two arms and two legs. There is no need to believe. There is no need to have faith. She knows. And this is what the Buddha wants us to do. So, well, it is not all right for Buddhists to gamble, as you know, it is just a form of greed. All right? I'll give you these notes so you can look into that in detail if you so wish. So, what is the Buddha Dharma not? It is not blind faith. And the one thing that sets the Buddha Dharma apart from other religions is no blind faith. No demand of blind faith from its followers. No dogma. Dogma, for those of you who do not know what it means, is a teaching by a religious body which cannot be challenged. That's why it's called dogma. You accept it on faith. In the Buddha Dharma, mere belief is dethroned and it is replaced by confidence based on knowledge. And that knowledge is Janice looking at her two arms and her two legs and saying, yes, I have two arms, I have two legs. And she developed more confidence in what I tell her. Because now she can see, hey, the guy not bluffing. I really have two arms and two legs. A Buddhist does not believe he can gain purity by mere faith in the Buddha. Knowledge and understanding, not blind faith, is needed in this path. This is taken from the Dhammapada, verse 97.
the man who is without blind faith. And in this, the word used is asado, who knows the uncreated, who has severed all links, destroyed all causes for karma, good and evil, and has thrown out all desires. He truly is the most excellent of men without blind faith, clearly taught to us. So the pedagogy, the training, the education of the Buddhist path is a hipasiko. Come and experience it for yourself, not come and believe, but come and experience for yourself. The gift of the Dhamma, the Buddha said, excels all gifts. This is our gift of the Dhamma. So, brothers and sisters, I hope you realize that no matter how hard you pray to whatever divine being, a divine being, a God, will not make you a God. That's not going to happen. In fact, he wants to be the only one, for he's a jealous God. One need not pray to the Buddha. One only needs to understand and live the Buddha Dharma. And you can be enlightened. So the one praying to a God takes refuge in power. His leap of faith is in the supposed power of that divinity to save him, to bail him out, to send him to some heavenly realm. The one who is walking the Buddha's footprints does not take refuge in power. He takes refuge in wisdom and knowledge. Like in the example that I use, Jenny's arms and legs. Now the word but means to wake up. And I'm sure most of you know. That's the root word of the word Buddha. The root word is but, which means to wake up, to know, to understand. So a person who wakes up and understands is called a Buddha, the awakened one. It is as simple as that. And the capacity to wake up, to understand, to love is called Buddha nature. So when Jenny say, as she said just now, I take refuge in the Buddha, they are expressing trust in their own capacity of understanding of becoming awake. Now, if I were to see Janice at KBMS, KMBS, sorry, and I see her prostrating in front of the Buddha image, and I'll do tap her and say, Janice, who are you prostrating to? And Jenny said, I am prostrating to the Buddha. Then I can tell Janice, no, that's not the Buddha. That's a stone image of someone. Don't even know who he looks like. Well, he's supposed to look like the Buddha, but it's a stone image. I don't think you are prostrating to a stone image. Then Jenny said, oh, I'm prostrating to the stone image which represents the Buddha. Janice is closer to the truth, but still not exactly that. In reality, Janice is prostrating to what she can be. That image represents all the qualities, all the good things that Janice will want to have. That image rep representing wisdom, compassion, etc., is what we want Janice to develop. Our ultimate refuge is the Dhamma. It is the Dhamma which made the Buddha awaken. And it is going to be the same Dhamma which is going to make every one of us awaken. So the Buddha and the Arahants are awake, which means that the rest of us are asleep. We are all living in a dream. And when a being is awake, he or she on looking around will see that all of the other people around him are stuporous. They're all living in dreams of delusion. So you can well understand that for an awakened being to look at us, he will only see why is our behavior so silly? Why is our behavior so maddening? 
even now, even when we are not exactly awakened, if we are to look back at our own lives, do you not see the dreamlike existence that we had? The silly things done and the useful things not done? So we must learn, investigate, and question until there is no doubt. And you will see, as you look at the stages of enlightenment, a syllabus whereby these fetters are dropped one by one progressively. Doubt, of course, is one of the fetters that the stream enterer will eradicate. And you can only eradicate this doubt when you can see that what the Buddha taught is true. So we need to still our mind. And the only way you can still your mind is to get rid of these emotions. And this is, of course, something familiar to all of you. These are the five hindrances, which are emotional states of either wanting something, or restlessness, remorse, or doubt, or ill will, or sloth and torpor. And with the stilling of these emotions, you develop right stillness, samadhi. Now, people have a very hard time letting go of their suffering because whatever that they are suffering now is something familiar to them. So out of a fear of the unknown, they actually prefer suffering that is familiar to them. So I want you to buy this really happy Buddhist insurance. This is the one that we should all have. Really happy Buddhist insurance. Now, this line, Buddhism is not an effort to arrive at unknown happiness, but to get rid of a known unhappiness. It's very profound. And I will come back to it again in a short while. But this is an extremely profound statement. Now, human beings are basically lazy. Now, one of the things a venerable taught me is that he said, I quote, people of all religions, whether you are Buddhist or you are non-Buddhist or whatever religion, whatever you say you believe or don't believe in, everyone will suffer, grow old, fall sick and die. Everyone, he said, even the most devout Buddhists will have suffering, aging, illness, and finally death. So he said, this is common to everybody, no matter what you say you believe or do not believe in. So this is what we all want to find a solution for. This is what we all want to deal, handle, face, with as little mental stress as possible. If everyone of every faith is to ask this basic question, you will be exactly like the Bodhisatta because he was asking this same question and you will walk this path. Many of our most dedicated Dhamma Dutta workers are people who have seen aspects of this first noble truth. And that is when they will want to find a solution. And if they can see that Didi Huachai is such a happy man, they can see Sister Jenny is such a happy girl. Why doesn't she get affected by all these things which are all around us? Then people want to know. And they will naturally seek what is it that you know that gives you this secret to handle these problems with peace in your mind. So most people don't really want the truth. They just want constant assurance that what they already believe in is the truth. And that is the reason why, Sister Li Ming, when you say something that goes against people's beliefs, they become so angry and may even turn violent because you have just shaken this foundation. Now, the Buddha was crystal clear with regards to the effectiveness of practitional prayers. 
If you look around, you will see the realities of death, sickness, ugliness, sadness, poverty, tragedies. Just open any newspaper. Nowadays, just look at the internet news. And it is obvious that no matter what faith you belong to, no matter how hard you pray, these are the common denominators that all living beings will face. This is, of course, very bad advertisement. But the Buddha did not come to advertise. He came to tell us the plain, stark truth. Another Pindika, as you know, was a very, very generous person. He was one of the main supporters of the early Sasana, and he saw the Buddha. And the Buddha taught him these very profound lessons. These five things, householder, are welcome, agreeable, pleasant, and hard to obtain in the world, the Buddha said. Which five? Long life. Everybody wants long life. Beauty. Everybody wants to be beautiful. Even men now put makeup, go for plastic surgery. Happiness, status, rebirth in a heavenly, happy sphere. Everybody wants these. And the Buddha said, now I tell you, these five things are not to be obtained by reason of prayers or wishes. Use your common sense. If they were to be obtained by reason of prayers or wishes, who here among the 300 odd people listening now would like them? No one will like them. Everyone will have long life, beauty, happiness, status, and rebirth. It is not fitting for the disciple of the noble ones who desires long life to pray for it or to delight in doing so. Instead, the di disciple of the noble ones who desire long life should follow the path of practice leading to long life. In so doing, he will attain long life, either human or divine. And the same is then repeated for beauty, happiness, status, rebirth. So if you want long life, then you jolly well work for it. Control your blood pressure, control your cholesterol, control your diabetes, don't smoke, don't take alcohol. If you want beauty, aha, then you must have lots of metta so that you have a beautiful smile like so many of the sisters I see here, etc. You create the causes for it, not pray for it. For one desiring long life, beauty, fame, acclaim, heaven, high families, etc., etc., the wise praise heedfulness in doing deeds of merit, being heedful, being mindful, and doing lots of good deeds, then you will have goodness immediately in the future, etc. And the whole, His Holiness the Dalai Lama clearly say, prayer is not enough. A man who prays is one who thinks God has arranged matters all wrong and that now he is telling God what to do. The late Christopher Hitchens, great man, lots and lots of his debates, etc., on the internet that you can see. And the Dalai Lama said it's unrealistic to think that the future of humanity can be achieved only on the basis of prayer. What we need to do is to take action. And that is the teaching of Kama Vipaka. If you want to change the future, if you want long life, happiness, beauty, etc., etc., then you create the cause for it. Kama is what you do today. Your future is created by what you do today, not prayers. That, Brother Bobby, is a very poor insurance policy. So there is nothing to believe in the Buddhist teachings, but a lot of things to verify for yourself so that you know. And the wise person will practice until he is one with the Dhamma, until he can have confidence in himself, independent of others. That's why the Buddha said you must be alike or an island to yourself. Now the Buddha Dharma, you will well understand, is the complete opposite of this that you see often on bumper stickers, 
Often on bumper stickers, I see this. Walking by faith and not by sight. Walking by faith and not by sight. But Buddha Dharma is the complete opposite. You walk by sight and not by blind faith. Please, brothers and sisters, if you have one thing we teach our children, ourselves, is always ask why. Blind faith is surrendering your own logic and reason. And this is the posture of a slave. Of course, Peanuts is another great philosophical comic. Good morning. Some mornings I'm going to get up real early and watch the sun rise. And his very brilliant brother says, actually, as you probably know, uh, the sun doesn't rise, you know, the earth turns. And of course, she gets a bit stunned. And then she said, okay, some morning I'm going to get up real early and watch the earth turn. Facts, realities may not be easy to accept for a lot of people. And what I just said, quoting the Buddha here, is similar to the earth and the sun. It's a fact, but it might be very difficult for many people to accept because this is what they have either been told or sold or asked to believe in their whole lives. Now on one occasion, the Venerable Sariputta was listening as the Buddha was teaching. And at the end of the discourse, the Venerable Sariputta was asked by the Buddha, do you believe in this teaching? And the Venerable Sariputta replied, no, he does not yet believe it. Now, remember, Venerable Sariputta is the Buddha's chief disciple, one of the two. Most people will be so angry, so insulted, that Venerable Sariputta will be excommunicated. Instead, here Sariputta was speaking the truth, as he had not yet developed his direct experiential understanding of what the Buddha taught. So while this reply made it appear that he was very rude and disrespectful, he actually wasn't. He spoke the truth because that is what the Buddha wanted all his disciples to do. Verify the truth for yourself. And in fact, the Buddha praised him for it and for his approach to learning that a wise person doesn't readily believe he should consider first before believing. The principle that very venerable Sariputta demonstrated is that the student of the Buddha Dharma is in agreement not because of simply faith in the Blessed One, but because he has seen it for himself that it is so. So when we learn the first noble truth, where we are told birth, aging, sickness, death, association with those you do not like, dissociation with those that you like, not getting what you want, the five grasping khandas, these are causes of suffering. These are the states of suffering. You have to see for yourself directly, is it so? So this is in the Samyutta Nikaya 48-44. Now we have sada in the Buddhist teachings. Sada, unfortunately, has been translated as fate by the early translators. And this has given rise to a very confusing situation because sada is not fate. Sada is the first of the five faculties. And often, if you just Google, you will see most translators translate it as faith. But sada is actually closer to the word confidence. Like I've shared with Janice, you've got two arms, you've got two legs. And now she looks and she says, yeah, I've got two arms and two legs. Yes, Dr. Wong is correct. I have confidence in what he told me because I've verified these myself. Sada is not faith. Sada is confidence in the Buddha's teachings as we know them to be experientially true and empirically provable. Now, almost all religions, as you know, are built on faith, rather blind faith, because it is a leap of faith. 
But in the Buddha Dharma, the emphasis is on seeing, knowing, understanding, and not on faith. Now, the word sada, as I said, is often translated as faith, but it is not. And no one can read the suttas without being struck by the importance the Buddha gave to sada. As I said, it's the first of our five faculties, which when developed will become the five powers, the first of the five powers. Now, if sada is translated as faith, there is hardly any possibility for an English educated person to understand this aspect of the Buddha's teaching. Sada is closer to the word trust, confidence, or reliance. And I repeat, the Buddha Dharma rejects blind faith. Blind faith is belief in religious doctrines, especially in relation to spiritual apprehension of divine truth, which is apart from proof. That means there is no proof. You just accept it on faith. Blind faith is in the substance of things hoped for and in the proving of things not seen. This is not wanted. This is not the pedagogy of the Buddha Dharma. Now, some of you I know in this group are very intelligent people. So one of you may suddenly ask me a question, but Dr. Wong, Nibbana is beyond all perception and cognition. Every one of us know it. There are no words which can even describe Nibbana. Therefore, are we not striving after some things based on faith? Here, what do knowledgeable Buddhists strive for? I think it is very important that all 330 odd people here now know that we do not strive after Nibbana. I say it again, we do not strive after Nibbana, but we strive for the abolition, the end of greed, sorrow, anger, hatred, delusion, and ignorance. And with the ending of greed, sorrow, hatred, anger, delusion, and ignorance, that is the state of Nibbana. This is a necessity to an intelligent man. When an intelligent man can see that life has the first noble truth, greed, sorrow, anger, hatred, delusion, and ignorance, just open the newspapers. Now we come back to the statement by the late Venerable Bhante Punaji. And you will clearly understand what I put out in purple. Buddhism is not an effort to arrive at unknown happiness, but to get rid of a known unhappiness. I repeat, we do not strive after Nibbana, but after the abolition, the ending, the termination, the cessation of greed, sorrow, anger, hatred, delusion, and ignorance. And the end of this, as is clearly stated in the third noble truth, is Nibbana. If there is one thing that you learn or take home from today's sharing, it is this slide. Liberation of freedom, the goal of Buddhism is attained through wisdom by walking in the footsteps of the Buddha by knowledge of reality. It is not an insurance policy of faith. The assurance that the Buddha gave us in the performing of good wholesome deeds is documented in the Kalama Sutta. And this is called the four great assurances. And the Buddha said, these are the four things, whether you believe in me or not, immaterial. Whether you believe in heaven, hell, future, no future, immaterial. Just be aware that these four great assurances are there, irrespective of whether you believe or you don't believe. What are these four assurances? One, if there is a world after death, I mean, really, if there is a world after death, if there is the fruit of actions rightly and wrongly done, 
then there is this basis by which with the breakup of this body, you have done all these good things, you have kept all these precepts, you have done so much dana, you will reappear in a good destination. Simple, clear, no fine print. This is the first assurance. Now, if there is no world after death, the Buddha said, kosong, ile, tara, and there is no fruits of actions rightly or wrongly done, then here in this present life, you will look after yourself with ease because you haven't done anything bad. You are free from enemies, hostilities, free from people who badmouth you, free from people who don't like you, ill will, and free from trouble because you haven't created the causes for it. This is the second generation, sorry, second assurance the Buddha gave you. Now, if evil is done through acting, still you have will no evil. Having done no evil action, from where will suffering touch me? This is the third assurance. And if no evil is done through acting, then I can assume myself pure in both aspects. This is the fourth assurance. So disciples of the noble ones, you and me and the whole lot of us here, keep our minds free from hostility, free from ill will, undefiled and pure. And you will have these four assurances in the here and now, no matter what you believe, or do not believe in. So brother Bobby, this is the best insurance premium, not to do any evil, to cultivate good, to purify one's mind. This is the best insurance premium. And this is the cost of the premium. A giver of food is a giver of strength, a giver of clothes, a giver of transport, a giver of light, vision, dhamma. And the one who gives a monastery, a center, and the one who teaches the dhamma. All this is what you do. This is your premium. Anybody can afford this premium. And who is the best insurance agent? If we, by the example of our lives, show that the Buddha Dharma leads to happiness, loving kindness and wisdom, then other people will want to follow and change. That is why it is important. We must have successful secular businessmen, Buddhists, etc., etc., who keep their precepts, who are morally upright, generous, happy, wise, able to handle the issues of life, because these are the role models for us. These are the role models who show such happy states that people want to know. Why are you so happy despite all these problems? So how do we conduct ourselves? Do not share the Buddha Dharma with words because our actions speak so loud. No one can hear your words. Share it instead with example. Live in tune with the Dhamma and be so happy that people around you will see it, sense it, feel it. Then they will want to be around you because they want to be a part of that happiness. And then they will ask you, why are you so happy? Huh? And now they are ripe for the Dhamma. They are ready. The Buddha's teachings are truly unique and unparalleled in history. First, if you are a free thinker, if your boyfriend, girlfriend are free thinkers, tell them, welcome for the Buddha Dhamma, because the Buddha's Dhamma wants you to be free to think. And if you claim to be a free thinker, make sure you are thinking because the Buddha Dharma gives you the freedom to think and to question without limitations. Remember, there is no dogma. Everything can be challenged. And the teacher, the Buddha himself challenges each of us to only accept his teachings after you have seen them to be true by yourself. It is years ahead of its time by its scientific pedagogy. It offers you hypothesis. You experiment with this hypothesis, directly observe within and without. 
and come to a logical, rational conclusion based on evidence. This is the scientific method. It avoids metaphysical questions. Those things that are speculation, forget it. They remain in the background. Work only on things that actually make a difference to both the lives of ourselves and of others. There is no caste, there is no sinner, and both males and females have the same opportunities and capabilities to be awakened. There are no commandments. I hope you realize that the Panchasila is only a set of training rules. They are Sikhapadam, Samadhiyami, that you willingly want to train. No commandments, zero. There's no priestly class, and even the Sangha is a democratic institution. There is no creator. All things come into being because of causes, effects, and conditions. We are so confident in the Buddha Dharma. We have so much faith in the Buddha Dharma, F-A-I-T-H, in the new Buddhist thinking, in the Buddhist aspect is not that of the traditional religions. We are looking at it as confidence, trust, reliance. That is what we consider as sadha. We are so confident that if science proves some belief of the Buddha Dharma wrong, then the Buddha Dharma will have to change. And this is something I have found to be very, very important in my personal quest. You have to be brutally honest with yourself. Do not bend reality to fit your belief. You have to bend your belief to fit the realities. And you can only see the truth when you are blatantly honest with yourself. Let nothing stand in the way to truth. The Buddha gave us the Dhamma. Now you cannot give the Dhamma to someone like you give a present. We can only point to it. We can invite him to listen to it. And it is in that spirit that you hear or read and then look within your own lives to see whether what is taught or shared in there has any relationship to your lives. And then whether you can apply it wisely or whether you can live in ignorance and just ignore it. So a proponent of the Dhamma doesn't dispute with anyone in the world. In fact, the Buddha himself said, I do not argue with the world. It is the world which argues with me. So with regards to any other teachers or doctrines, we must look to see if that path, that teaching, that practice, that lineage, that tradition, whether that leads to the complete ending of greed, hatred, and delusion in your lives, whether it leads to the end of suffering. That is our invitation. That is our responsibility. Thank you very much to every one of you here. Next week and the week after, we will take a break from sharing myths, series of sharings, because Subang Jaya Buddhist Association has a speaker for the next two weeks, and we would like to encourage more speakers to come forward to share. So we will be taking a two week break and then coming back on Christmas. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Funa, for the inquisitive based session. Now we would like to open for questions. So please post your question in the comment section of your live Facebook. And then I shall read out your question. The first question, okay, let's start the ball rolling. First off, we have a question from Sister Su Wong. 
she asked if can being she asked if can being a good practicing Buddhist prevent our past bad karma from ripening? Dr. Puna? Dear sister, you have this amount of salt, let's say half a cup full of salt. And if you are to look at that half a cup full of salt as something undesirable and unwholesome, and you take that half a cup full of salt and then you fill that cup with water, pure water, stir it, and then you drink it, it will still be very, very salty. Now, if you take that half a cup full of salt and you bring it to the nearest swimming pool and you dilute that half a cup full of salt in that swimming pool, and now you take back a cup of water from the swimming pool and imagining that the water from that swimming pool is clean and you taste it, it will be tasteless. In the Salt Crystal Sutta, the Buddha used this analogy. In our past, you and me, all of us, have good, wholesome, and also so-called bad, unwholesome causes or karmic deeds that may ripen as vipaka. Whether they will ripen or whether they do not ripen depends on conditions. You can plant a durian in the desert, nothing will happen. You need to plant it and believe in um, bentong or something to that effect for it to have good fruits. So our past good deeds or past bad deeds will come into reality with conditions which allows them to. So all of us have good, wholesome deeds. That's why we are what we are today. And we also will have some not so good deeds, which the analogy here being that half a cup full of salt. Now, if you do lots of good deeds, it is like diluting that salt, which is still the same amount in that swimming pool of water. If you do only very little good deeds, then it is just diluting it in that cup of water. So the conditions will allow it to ripen. In verse one and two of the Dhammapada, Verse one and two of the Dhammapada are a pair, which tells you that if you do bad deeds, then it will follow you like the wheels of the wagon that follows the hoof of the ox. If you do good deeds, good wholesome deeds, then it is like a shadow that follows you and that never leaves. But Sister Su Ching, how many of us are aware of our shadows? Literally none. Literally none. So whatever good things that we have, we fail to appreciate it. So Sister Janice might have beautiful hair, skin, etc., etc., etc. But does she appreciate it or just take it for granted? She may have very good environment, etc. Again, we just take it, Siti Yangdama. But when you, she have a toothache, oh heavens, all hell will break loose. If she has a migraine, oh heavens, all hell will break loose. Because that bad thing is like the wheels of the wagon that follows the oxen. Very heavy, very difficult. Our good things, we just take it for granted. And don't forget Sister Su Chin, even with your beautiful shadow from the good deeds that the Buddha gave in that analogy, if you walk into a dark room, what will happen to your shadow? It disappears. So if you are to do lots of nasty things now, the good things of the past may not have the conditions to come to fruition. So similarly, the bad things of the past, the wheel that follows the ox, we can send Janice to the best dentist and get rid of that toothache. We can send Janice to see the best doctor to get rid of that migraine or headache. So even the wheels that follow the hoof of the oxen, that road can be smooth. That road can be uphill, downhill. The load on that wagon can also vary. Such is the depth of the first and second verses of the Dhammapada, that it is what made me so interested because it changes, uh, it gives a completely different viewpoint on 
religion or philosophy. All right, I hope I've answered your question. Thank you, Dr. Puna. Sorry, there were some technical difficulties. Um, moving on to the next question from Sister Jean Lim. As scientific as Buddhism is, then why is it not as popular as it should be since science pervades our life in all spheres? All right, Sister Jean, is it? Very yes. simple answer, Sister Jean. The Buddha Dharma is never meant to be a popular religion. The Buddha Dharma is effective for people, one, who have seen dukkha, two, who have little dust in their eyes. And that is the reason why the Buddha himself, when he first became awakened, started to ask himself whether this generation, 2,600 years ago then, would even understand. Because people would rather believe a pleasant lie or a pleasant reassurance than a harsh truth. And the Buddha Dharma is all about harsh truth. It is not about pleasant reassurances. It is not about, oh, it's all right, don't worry, believe, and you go to heaven. It's not any of those. So it will never be a popular religion in that sense of the word, because a popular religion demands that it is so simple that you go to a and w or go to McDonald and you order happy meal, set A, set B. That's it, so simple. In the Buddha Dharma, you can spend 30 years of your life studying and you're still a beginner because there is so much. It is like studying science. It is like studying quantum physics. And it, in fact, it is in many ways quantum physics. So in that sense, it is not going to be a popular religion. Science is never going to appeal to everyone. A lot of people are simply not interested. A lot of people just want, give me this, I accept it, I pay you this, I go to heaven, full stop, end of the story. That is what people want. So you have to realize that, sister, you can save yourself, you can study, but there will be other people who will be like you, and there will also be a lot of other people who just want to eat Happy Meal. They are not interested in learning a lot of details, developing direct insight, etc., etc. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. The next question is from Brother Chu Tin Loy. How to prove whether there are dev devas and other heavenly worlds as described in the suttas? Who is asking you to prove it? All right. Now, these have various interpretations. I'm sure you may be familiar with Ajahn Buddha Dasa. He has a completely radical different interpretation of these devas or heavenly beings. All right, he has a completely different interpretation and I'm not gonna go into it. You can easily look it up yourself in the internet. All his books are available, Brother Chiwun. So there is no need for you to prove it if you don't believe in it, fine. Makes absolutely no difference to the Buddha Dharma. If you want proof for it, I don't think that at this point, anyone in any faith can prove any of these to you. So for me, these are actually unimportant. These are unimportant things. These things do not solve the problem of that arrow which is stuck in me right now. My immediate concern is treating that arrow which is stuck in me right now. If you go onto the internet 
you will see some previous talks that I have given on heaven and hell. And you may be interested to look at those. You will also see that I have very radical views on what the Buddha taught about heaven and hell. You can go and find it on YouTube as well. It's also there. So to me, these are unimportant because these are metaphysical. They do not lead to your awakening. They do not lead to your enlightenment. All right. Thank you. And the last question, I presume, is from Brother David T. Seong Pin. He asked, wisdom and compassion, which is more important to a Buddhist? Is your left arm or your right arm more important to you? Well, both are equally important, isn't it? You need both. You need wisdom. You need compassion. They are the wings of Buddhism. Now, if you have lots of wisdom, let's say Sister Li Ming has lots of wisdom, lots and lots of it, but that's about all she does, nothing. So wisdom is knowing what to do. Virtue is actually doing it. So Sister Li Ming may have lots of wisdom. She knows I must do this, I must do this. This is the best thing, this is the best solution. But she does nothing. If she has virtue, she's actually doing it. So remember, wisdom is knowing what to do. Virtue is actually doing it. And metta, karuna are the states of mind that will come in. When your mind is devoid of this greed called I. You see, in life, almost everything that we do, and I'm being very frank here, almost everything that people do is in relation to this big thing called I. What do I gain out of it? The Cantonese will say, don't do. Right? Most of you are from KL, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because KL is where Cantonese is widely spoken. So most people think, work, rationalize, act around this big premise called I. Everything. That's where greed, anger, ill will will arise. You challenge this I ill will, anger will arise. Now, on the other hand, if Sister Janice is so well trained that she can remove this I from the equation, she acts without this I, then she is truly acting out of metta and karuna. I hope you realize, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, that no matter how many zillion times you chant metta, chanting metta, metta, may you be well, may I be well, may you and all be well, may he be well. That metta is only genuine when you have removed that I from the equation. When you have removed the I from the equation, then naturally the four states of metta, karuna, mudita, upeka will be your state of mind. You will naturally be loving, compassionate, rejoicing, and have equanimity. In fact, to understand how equanimity can come in, you must understand the Dhamma. If not, it's all talk. You must understand. So metta, karuna, mudita, ubeka will be that mind state of a being who has seen, understood, impermanence, dukkha, and anatta. That is his mind state. He's not a stone, you know. He's not someone sitting there like a rock. Our emotions which arise because of greed, hatred, anger, ill will, jealousy, are negative emotions. But if you remove that I, that means you understand emptiness, you understand anicca, dukkha, anatta, and by that I mean you really understand, then your mind state will be devoid of the word I. And your natural mind state is that of metta, karuna, mudita, upeka. So, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, 
wisdom is needed because you need to know. You need to know. If you know, then metta karuna will be your natural nature. So it is not which is more important. They are both important. One is the expression of the other. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. There was another question that just came in. Will it be okay for you to answer, Doctor? Yeah, sure, no problem. Okay. It's from Chui Waikin. The person asked, the person said, many Buddhist centers will perform prayers on the first moon, 15 moon, Vesak Day, and Kuan Yin celebration. What is your opinion of this regarding the functions of prayers? Well, Brother Tuan, we are all at different levels of progress in our path. Some are very senior, like yourself. Some are just barely starting. Some come in because they want psychological support. So we are all different. We are not all made from a factory that stamped us all out with the same state of mind. So acts, rites, rituals are important for someone who wants these activities for its psychological support. These activities are fellowship builders. These activities create cohesion. These activities are all educational. I had shared on all this, I, on, on the sharing topic, are you religious? They are all educational. All your pujas, all your refuge shaking, your picking of the precepts, etc., your chanting of the suttas, they are all educational. That is why it is so important that the people taking part must understand why they are offering, why they are putting a candle, why they are offering fruits, etc. Now, as you walk the path, you will realize that these activities become less and less important because you know that they do not lead to awakening. They are very good psychological supports, but they do not lead to awakening. They are very good for cohesive activities for fellowship, but it does not lead to awakening. Awakening needs to be a step beyond this. So do not get stuck at this level. Do not get attached to this level, because if you do, it becomes a factor to your progress. So as long as you are performing these with understanding, why you are doing it as an educational exercise, as an exercise in fellowship, as an exercise in humility, and an exercise in respect and gratitude to the Triple Gem, then you are fine. But if you are doing this thinking, by doing this, all my problems are solved, then I'm so sorry, but you are being very naive. Because people had for thousands of years prayed and prayed and prayed, and their problems are not solved. Okay, Janice? More questions came in. So I'll, I'll read them to you. Another one is from Brother Ben Hoy. Dr. Puna, in your last slide, you mentioned that Buddha uttered, I do not dispute with the world, rather it is the world that disputes with me. Kindly explain more on the meaning of this sentence, especially the word world. Other teachers, other philosophers, you must understand that during the Buddha's time, there were lots of people who declined to follow the Vedic tradition and went out and sought out their path. These ascetics were the original free thinkers. These ascetics were the original people who said, I'm not going to follow the established pathway of the Vedas, the priestly caste, etc., etc. I'm going to look. And in the Buddha's time, there were many, many. There are many, many schools of philosophy. If you look at the first book of the Diganikaya, you will see so many different schools, so many different philosophies that are existent during the Buddhist time. And it is in the fashion of that day that they will meet each other in certain common places and debate, argue, 
contemplate, discuss, perhaps diplomatically, perhaps not diplomatically, because you see in the suttas, sometimes they were very diplomatic, sometimes they were not diplomatic. But the Buddha's outlook had always been, I do not dispute with people. Remember the spirit of the Kalama Sutta. In the spirit of the Kalama Sutta, the Buddha did not condemn anybody. He did not say, this is good, this is bad, that is lousy, that is rubbish. Instead, he said, is it praised by the wise? Is it leading to goodness? When done, will it lead to welfare and happiness, etc." He is using a very experiential approach in outcome to these things. So the Buddha said, I do not dispute with the world because when you are an awakened being, as I said, if I'm an awakened being, and now I look around at all of us, all I see are sleepy people lost like a drunkard. Now, are you going to dispute with a sleepy person who is behaving like a drunkard? You're not, because you know that this person who is drunk is not going to be able to speak logically or rationally. But there will be some, of course, who will understand. So when the word world is used here, it is, to my understanding, the world of the different schools, the philosophers, the ascetics, and those who have come to ask the Buddha, challenge the Buddha, debate with the Buddha. Okay, brother? In the next question from Brother Ananda Fong. How can we start the practice of assuring a better life for ourselves? Brother Ananda, Brother Ananda is an old friend, an old dear friend. How can we have a better life for ourselves? Well, first and foremost, look at the Mangala Sutta. The Mangala Sutta is a beautiful road map for how you can have a better life. Starting with, let's say, Janice as a young primary school kid, secondary school kid. And what does the Mangala Sutta start with? Do not associate with the fool, but associate with the wise. So if Sister Janice from young had associated with wise, good people, she imbibes these principles, she learns with good things, she's not going to do drugs or something silly like that and spoil her entire life. And then you go on. In the Mangala Sutta, there are 38 steps. And of course, among them is make sure you have an education, make sure you're well trained in a discipline, make sure that you have the means to support your family. You know, it said that one of the great blessings or auspicious things in the Mangala Sutta is to support your wife and children. Notice wife, huh? singular, huh? not plural, huh? wife, huh? singular. Okay, in the Buddhist time, to me, that's amazing because if you look at the people that the Buddha had conversation with, Pasanadi, etc., they got lots of wives. And here the Buddha in the Mangala Sutta referred to it in a singular term. And then it goes on to keeping the precepts, goes on to generosity, goes on to listening to the Dhamma in a timely place, meeting noble people, etc., etc. So how can you assure yourself, even as a lay person, of a reasonably good life, a reasonably comfortable, balanced life, follow the Mangala Sutta. I think that's probably the best. I think that Sutta is wonderful as a roadmap for any young person. As you walk this path, each of the things that all of us would have gone through is actually listed in the Mangala Sutta. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. The next question from Corway Ken. The Buddha spoke about balancing the spiritual faculties of faith and wisdom. What does this mean? How can we develop both faith and wisdom in a balanced, optimal, and effective way? Okay, Brother Corway Ken. The five faculties. Faith, which I told you, very bad translation. Okay, this ideally should not be used with the word faith because it completely distorts. So let's say we use confidence or trust or reliance. Then you have energy, you have mindfulness, you have samadhi or stillness in your wisdom. So this is supposed to balance this, this is supposed to balance this, and this is to make sure that they are balanced. Okay, so we've got 
these five faculties that we need to develop so that these five faculties become the five powers, okay? So that they can help power us to awakening. So confidence, trust, reliance, that's the beginning of the path. The Buddha spoke highly of it in many suttas about sada. And yet, as I told you, in the Dhammapada, that's that line about asado, okay? Please do not go to the extreme of blind faith. That's no good. Now you have confidence, you have trust, but these are all the things in the Buddha's teachings that you have confidence in, that you must verify. When you verify, when you see, when you experience, you have wisdom. So these have to be balanced, all right? Between what we have confidence in and what you know. So Sister Janice can have lots of confidence in Dr. Wong. Dr. Wong says Sister Janice got two arms and two legs. Lots of confidence, but she does nothing to verify it. That's no good. Sister Janice have to verify it. All right. On the other hand, Sister Janice might be so only one extreme that no confidence in Dr. Wong at all. So that's also no good because many of us enter based on just sada. So you need to balance this too. I have confidence and I'm verifying it. Aha, it's true. This reinforces my sada. Then with my reinforced sada, I see the first noble truth. Yeah, it's true, you know. And then that reinforces my sada. And then I go on to the second noble truth. Yes, indeed, the Buddha is right. That reinforces my sada more. So sada, possibly we should just skip to the word sada rather than use the word faith. Just like we should stick to the word dukkha than use the word suffering because they all have very distorted, limited views of what the Buddha actually meant. So these have to be balanced. They cannot be overwhelmingly this or overwhelmingly that. They have to be balanced. Energy with stillness of your mind. And of course, mindfulness being the main balancing factor for these five faculties. All right. So we need to have confidence, but you cannot do nothing. You have to develop that wisdom by acknowledging, seeing, verifying. And then when you have that wisdom, you grow your sada because you know that the Buddha is right. So as your wisdom grows, you will reach a point whereby you have no doubt, you know he is right. There might be things that you have not verified. Nibbana, we have not verified. All right, but you know, you have enough evidence up to date that the Buddha is right. All right, brother? Brother call we can, brother, I think. Thank you, doctor. And the next one from Sister Chia Eileen. There are a lot of common people less educated, hardly can understand the profound teaching of the Buddha, but been doing a lot of good things. Do you think this is blind faith? Well, we all start with blind faith. I'm sure you and me too started with blind faith. Okay? And that's the one I told you I want to convert from that term insurance to a better insurance policy. Now, there are lots of good people Lots of good people, do lots of dana. I ask them for whatever, help me publish this book, help me print this book. No issue, Dr. Wong, I believe in you. Here, give you a check or whatever. Lots of good people. And some of them are knowledgeable in the Buddha Dharma. Some of them are not knowledgeable in the Buddha Dharma, but they know what is a good thing. They know what is a good deed. They are not gonna do terrible things. And so they do these good things. So these may not even have any faith at all, but they are still basically, as I said, good, honest people who are very generous. And I am again, you're very sure you are aware of such people. You probably know such people. They probably don't know Buddha, but beyond being a historical figure, they probably don't know anything about the Buddha, but yet they are good people that we respect, okay? And then there are good people with faith. In that word under brackets, huh? good people with confidence in the Buddha Dharma. All right, so these good people in the Buddha Dharma, uh, with confidence in the Buddha Dharma is what we are trying to nurture, cultivate, make. And I'm so glad that nowadays on the internet, my wife is only two, three times a week. There's so many programs offered by the various societies in Malaysia, nurturing this group of people from maybe blind faith at the beginning to now knowledgeable, confident Buddhists. Now, they also have people who are not very nice people. 
but they have a lot of faith, blind faith. But they are not very nice people. All right, people that you wouldn't want to be alone with in a lane somewhere, but they have lots of blind faith. Just to give an example, when I was practicing as a doctor, you had people who will see me and they have got tattoos from A to Z, all kinds of things that, let me put it this way, Sister Janice, you wouldn't want to be with him in the lane somewhere because you'll probably fear for your life. But yet he tells me, Dr. Wong, should you need any support for whatever Dhamma work you want to do, whatever book you want to print, just tell me. I will give you the money. Of course, I dare not open my mouth. Lah. Okay, but this is what I mean. You have these various combinations of people. What we really want, to put it in summary, are people who, even if you do not know the Buddha Dharma, never mind, you're at least a good, decent human being doing good deeds, there will be the coming causes that you are planting right now. Hopefully, you are a good person and you start to have some confidence, some faith. And people like Gladians, people like KMBS, people like BGF, Subang Jaya, come in and nurture so that that faith now becomes a knowledgeable Buddhist. You are no longer someone who just has blind faith, but someone who has learned and has confidence in the Buddha Dharma. Look, I've got relatives. And I think one of them is probably online right now listening. He's, he's 10 years older than me, for heaven's sake. He entered into the Buddha Dharma very late in his life, but he has seen Dukkha and he wants to learn. And so it really doesn't matter. He too begin with just faith. Oh, people tell me it's good, okay lah. But we want to make sure that this cohort of people develop into knowledgeable people knowledgeable in the Buddha Dharma and have confidence in the Buddha's teachings. They know that it's real and we hope to bring them more into the various more subtle aspects of the Buddha Dharma rather than just saying, oh, okay, try out something, I go to the temple, full stop. That's not what the Buddha would have wanted. Remember, even at the Buddha's dying moments, he said, it is not these ways in which you honor me. You honor me by practicing the Buddha Dharma. All right? Okay, I think this is the last question from Brother Puna. Of the four states of mind, Upeka is considered as the most important state and most difficult to achieve. Can you please elaborate on this? No, it's not from Brother Puna. Brother Puna is sitting on this end of the computer. Oh, sorry. So Sister Barbara. <laughs> sorry, sorry and, Sister Barbara. I was just reading, uh, yeah. And Sister sorry. Janice, do you know that I know Sister Barbara when I was a medical student in the University of Malaya and Sister Barbara was already working there? We already respected Sister Barbara then because she was already working as a social worker. When I was a medical student, can you imagine me was once Okay, a medical student walking in a university. Sister Barbara, hope you are well. May you have good health, huh? Well, Sister Barbara, of the four mind states, you are right in the sense that Upeka is considered one of the most difficult states to achieve because to really achieve and understand Upeka means you must understand the Buddha Dharma. You must understand the Four Noble Truths. You must understand Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, you must understand sunya, you must understand reality. When you can understand all these, then truly a state of upeka, for what is worth translated as equanimity, will be the state of mind. That means your mind is so still, so able to be remaining calm despite all that affects us mortal beings. Your mind is so calm and still, that it remains equanimous despite all this. Yes, I agree with you entirely. It is one of the most difficult states. Remember, even for the four stages of enlightenment, even the person who is going to be an arahan, the anagami, he still has restlessness. He still has conceit. He still has not understood Wu Zi Yi Wu De. He still has not understood Yi Wu Suo De Gu, Xing Wu Guo Ai. It is only the Arahan who would have eradicated conceit and eradicated restlessness. So yes, sister, 
it is not easy because to achieve upekha, you need to have a clear understanding of the Buddha Dharma. All right. Okay, thank you, Dr. Puna. We have now come to the end of our Q&A session.